Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with, with you all. Uh, uh, I'm Marcos Ribeiro. I'm the president of CFA Society Portugal. Um, let me welcome our, our guests today. Um, uh, thank, uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you all for being here today uh, with us. Thank you, Gautier. Th thank you, Harry and, and Tim. Uh, I, I think we have today a, a ne uh, an excellent um, uh, uh, invited guests from, from uh, Amundi, uh, from Fidelity and from Jupiter. Uh, uh, and, and the idea today is to talk about such a hot topic as, as inflation. Um, we, are, we are very keen on doing such, uh, such sort of, of events here at CFA Society Portugal. I think it's, it's very important for both our members, but today we are sharing this with the, with the, with the society at large, I think, uh, and we believe it's part of our mission as well to contribute to to these uh, to to a greater awareness by the investment community uh, in Portugal, um, uh, and we like to share all this all these uh, strategic thought about investments uh, with this with our community. So um, so let's uh, with no uh, further ado, so let's let's start with our with our um, uh, event. Um, let me just uh, remind you that, that we are recording this session. Um, this session will be moderated by, by uh, Francisco Almeida. Francisco is, is one of our board members, apart from being a, 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 a CFA charter holder. He, he, he's a portfolio um, a manager um, at Banco Santander, uh, at Banco CTT, sorry. Um, it's, uh, he's responsible for managing more than, uh, uh, more than 500 million fixed assets of the bank's proprietary account. And he has an extensive uh, experience in asset management, brokerage, and portfolio management in both equities and, and fixed income. So, so uh, uh, Francisco will be will be leading this and uh, uh, moderating this this session. Um, it will ba basically we'll have some presentations from the speakers and then a panel discussion and of course uh, with, with plenty of space for Q and A from the audience and uh, and I would like uh, just to remind you that that you should uh, um, you, sh you can you can pop up the, your questions on uh, on the on the appropriate uh, chat in the in the, in the Zoom uh, uh, in the Zoom platform. Um, and um, and uh, and will be addressed uh, in in due time. Um, okay, we know. Uh, I think uh, now uh, I've shared with you all these housekeeping rules. Uh, so, Francisco, can, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Muito, to, uh, Muito obrigado, Marcos. Thank you so much. I share your, your view. I'm I'm pretty excited to to today's meeting, to today's debate. Um, we, we came from a year from a year that we have uh, completely unprecedented. We we we, we heard and, and read this word so many times in the last twelve months, and in fact, it was it was outstanding year, um, not for the good reasons. Um, for some context, we we saw in some days, more or less one year ago, central banks buying around fifteen billion dollars uh, per day. In 2020, ECB bought 6,690 6, euros per person, per eurozone person, almost 7,000 euros per, per each one of us. I don't know the ones that are in the UK, but at least for, for the uh, eurozone members. Almost exactly one year ago, we saw crude at minus $40. Today is around 60, 65 positive. It was really remarkable. And how will be the consequences after this? We saw, we saw in Europe an approach to try to, to help and target companies to try to preserve um, employment. In the US, the situation was different. 
unemployment soared, but we saw uh, a lot of money going directly to people via via mail via mail classic mail we saw the the amount of money of money that went to to people um a lot of unemployment and today the situation is different recently i i've read that in in florida mcdonald's is paying 50 dollars to someone who goes to an interview to flip burgers so mcdonald's today is paying 50 dollars just to show up for an interview this is this is something remarkable and, and a lot of change has happened in the last 12 months. Uh, we have the massive package from Joe Biden. We have the EU next generation. Um, and with this economic context, how will inflation move from here? Are we seeing a return of the roaring 20s that we saw in last century? Opinions diverge on this. I, very clever people have completely different views that we'll have high inflation and the other ones believe that we'll have no inflation at all. We are living in a world where the marginal cost of a new Netflix subscription is zero. So we'll have to wait to, to see how will all of this unfold. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to have here three brilliant portfolio managers to share their views with, with, with us, and uh, I think it will be very interesting. Uh, I would like to, to thank, to, thank to, to Cristina from Amundi, to Anna from Fidelity, and from Francisco from Jupiter to arrange this, this conversation. And, uh, and with no further ado, I would like to introduce Gauthier. Gauthier um, works for CPR Asset Management, it's, it's from Amundi. Uh, he's a product, um, he was a product specialist on Asia, um, excluding Japan equities in Hong Kong. So it's interesting also to see this view from Asia. And, uh, and now he's an expert in, in, in fixed income. Gautier, I would like to start with you and, and if possible to, to in around 10 minutes to share your view from where do you think inflation, this tilt, will, where, where will it balance? Yeah. Sure. Uh, thanks, Francisco. Can you can you see my screen? I'm, I'm sharing right now. Okay, good, we great. Um, so, great question uh, on uh, how uh, inflation is getting hot. Um, so, on the inflation outlook, basically there are uh, two ways. I mean, for me, there are two ways to answer this question: uh, one on the short term and one on the long term. Uh, on the long term, if we start on the long term, we think that uh, we are uh, at the end uh, of a multi-decennial trend of, uh, of falling inflation, uh, meaning goods and services prices, uh, regardless the country, uh, regardless the sector, uh, have been steady and did not increase much uh, over time. Uh, inflation has been uh, falling uh, over the last decades. And, uh, and to us, this is a result of, uh, of uh, a long mega trends uh, that include, of course, um, increased globalization, uh, permanent uh, numerical revolution, of course, but also uh, improved uh, global trade. I mean, over the last decades, uh, just looking at the, at the, at the, the global trade uh, uh, progress is, is, is impressive. But, uh, as of today, we, we might see uh, at Amundi, at CPR, that uh, we are at the end of the road. Uh, multi -fac multiple factors uh, show us that we kind of face a, a, a long-term uh, trend uh, reversal. Some of these factors are uh, conjectural. Uh, I'm thinking uh, excess of savings in OECD countries, uh, bumps in, uh, in perfect globalization. Uh, the COVID crisis was, uh, was uh, probably the best example. Uh, but some of these factors are also uh, more long-term and structural, uh, like the uh, ongoing uh, energy transition. I mean, everyone is, is talking about this green energy now, and uh, we are seeing kind of a transition from uh, cheap uh, oil and gas uh, toward uh, very much uh, expensive uh, green energy. So basically, this is, this is for the long term. 
uh, easier to 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 think about the the, the short term, of course, uh, when you think about the COVID crisis, and uh, you uh, just showcased uh, many uh, many examples uh, in your introduction. Uh, I was aware of the of the McDonald's situation in Florida, uh, giving uh, 50, uh, 50 bucks to people showing for the interviews. Uh, it's it's kind of crazy. Um, so uh, on top, of course, of the, 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 the base effect uh, that we are seeing right now and that will increase actually in the, in the coming months, uh, we believe uh, at CPR uh, the COVID crisis actually trigger, acted as a trigger for, for short-term inflation. Um, of course, the support and uh, the recovery plans uh, from both uh, central banks and governments are massive, so I'm not going to go over uh, everything, especially in the US. Uh, this led uh, recently to uh, a huge uh, increase in money supply in uh, developed economies, so you, you have a, a few graphs here. Uh, but what's interesting when you when you see uh, when you look at this graph and and again the the McDonald's situation is a perfect example. Uh, much of this money printing uh, is is actually uh, used uh, to supply money directly directly into people's hands. Um, again, I'm thinking a uh, payroll protection program. I'm thinking uh, stimulus checks, and these are money directly being handed to people. Uh, it's not it's not uh, money being uh, endlessly recirculated in uh, in equities and stocks uh, and, and and fixed income bonds uh, like we saw uh, before uh, decades before. Uh, it's money directly being handed to people. So that makes a, a huge difference. And also, of course, uh, governments and the Fed have made it very clear that uh, this combined fiscal and uh, monetary stimuli uh, will be deployed uh, over time. Uh, certainly after that, uh, the output gap turns positive, even though uh, quite recently they changed uh, their tone on that. And uh, maybe we'll come back to that uh, uh, later, uh, a slight change in their uh, policy stance. Um, so uh, this, this support and recovery plans, this is the first impact, uh, the first effect of the COVID. Uh, at the same time, even maybe even more important or more interesting is, is the shortage of uh, goods and, and services uh, due to lockdowns uh, across industries, across regions. Uh, basically, it's not targeting uh, any, any region or uh, specific industry. Uh, here, I graphed two very uh, easy to understand example. Uh, on the left hand side, copper prices uh, going up uh, like crazy last year. Um, I'm relating this to uh, high demand for green projects, again, energy green projects, and also, of course, uh, infrastructure spending that uh, governments uh, will uh, supply and will uh, finance over the, the coming months and quarters. More generally, if you think commodities uh, since the beginning of the year, I think we're up uh, around 20% or so. And, uh, and second example, the shortage of uh, containers uh, pushed cargo prices by, by an amazing 400% uh, end of last year. Uh, and of course, this is due to the sanitary uh, disruption and, and the, cat, the catch ups that uh, we happen to have uh, in, uh, in November and December on, on top of the end of the year usual uh, effect. So to us, this is a Clearly, a quite a good example in, in the stop, in the halt of the perfect uh, globalization we've seen uh, uh, for so long. Uh, now, what we have is uh, social distance, distancing as well. We have uh, partial uh, reopenings all over the world. Um, even in France here, I mean, we have a, a kind of a half reopenings. It's very gradual. And all of this creates uh, business uh, inefficiencies. Uh, slowdowns in production and services. So this is pure uh, uh, cost push inflation on the short term. Uh, so in the end, what we see is, is pretty simple. It's uh, many people currently have more money uh, now than they have than they did have uh, before the COVID. Um, and if you put uh, additional money supply into the hands of people, and at the same time you have a, a shortage or disruption in goods and services. Uh, this is where you can easily have uh, a price inflation. And, uh, and I know uh, for, for a very long time we have had uh, uh, asset inflation, asset price inflation, but uh, there, is a, there is something I read uh, lately that says uh, 
uh, inflation uh, grows where the money flows. And uh, when you see these uh, stimulus checks uh, in the US handed directly to people, uh, then you can think about uh, a beginning uh, of, uh, of uh, goods and services inflation, so a, a rise in, uh, in CPI. Uh, Market-wise, as well, uh, uh, break-evens uh, have been uh, rising. Um, best proxy for, for inflation as a market, of course. Uh, plus, there is an additional factor that uh, in the US, there is a very limited supply of tips. Uh, I'm not going to cover all of it, but uh, it's, it's, it's limited and, and projection uh, as well are, are quite limited. So, uh, not, not so much room to cover yourself uh, against inflation. Um, so, of course, in a nutshell, and uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up here, uh, all factors are here for a short-term inflation rise in, in 2021, and we've seen, uh, we, we are seeing this uh, beginning of the year. Uh, this is mostly due to, to base effect again, but uh, we are also seeing on the longer term, even if the equation is a slightly uh, more tricky to, to, to resolve, uh, but central banks have uh, also a, a huge role in a, in, in a potential uh, long-term uh, change of uh, paradigm. And uh, so I'm not talking uh, about uh, an inflation peak here, a surge in inflation, but rather we see inflation level over the next few years uh, actually higher than it was over the last few years. I mean, we've, uh, we've kind of broken the, the downtrend uh, uh, line uh, that has been in place for 30 to 40 years of uh, 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 falling inflation. And, uh, and we might be at the, at the end of this road uh, at the same time uh, of this uh, COVID trigger. Thank you so much, Gauthier. Um, I would like to introduce Harry, Harry Richards. Uh, he's a CFA shareholder and works in, in Jupiter in, in managing the strategic bond fund. So I'm sure that his exposure to the fixed income markets will as well help a lot. All of the three guests from us are, are an expert on fixed income will, will also be very interesting to, to hear. Harry, I will, I will pass the, the floor to you to share your views um, and we would like to, to listen to you. All good That's great. Thank slides. you very much. And I, I hope you can uh, you can see my slides. Um, okay, so I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna kick off and I'm going to present a slightly different view, uh, potentially a little bit of a contrarian view. And it really comes down to timing and it comes down to what's in the price today um, and really what's changed relative to history. Um, a lot about inflation is very, very well known, and you know, we know about the base effect, we know commodity prices are rising very aggressively. We know there are big challenges with regards to bottlenecks, and we know money supply growth is, is running at very, very high levels uh, relative to history, uh, especially in certain markets. And so the question is, will that lead to a sustained and persistent rise in inflation expectations that continues well out into the future, or will this be something that starts to fade out a little bit and this reflation narrative begins to be questioned? Um, in terms of, in terms of um, you know, market predictions, I think the Yogi Berra quote is, is very, very apt. And it's, you know, it is uh, very tough to make predictions, especially when it relates to the future. So you know, take everything with a pinch of salt. And I think there are two very, very good sides to this debate. And that's why I think it's such a good topic to be discussing. But I'm going to give you my take. So um, on this first slide, what you can see is that the break-even rate. We've heard a little bit about this already. Uh, we're up, you know, around this 240, to just over 240 level on 10-year break-evens. And to put that in context, historically, actual realized core CPI over the last 20 years has averaged about 2%. And in the post-financial crisis period, it's been around 1.8%. And actually, the Fed's favored measure has averaged around 1.7%. So you can see we're in this kind of new paradigm uh, in recent history in terms of expectations. We're definitely at that higher that higher end of uh, the spectrum. And from our perspective, we want to question and challenge this narrative and understand if we may be at a turning point for the reflation trade to be queried. And in terms of expectations, you can see on this following slide, um, the vast majority of the market, this is a survey done by Bank of America, expects steeper yield curves. And that's really a proxy for rising inflation expectations over time. Um, so it feels like a lot of people are all in on this trade. And actually, when you look at these historic peaks, 
where the uh, number of part participants in the market has expected this degree of steepening, typically it's actually been a local maximum in terms of the steepness of the yield curve at that juncture. And so from my perspective, when we think about the balance of this year, if people are positioned for this, um, could we question that as the base effects roll out from May and beyond? May is the easiest period for base effects. As we go into the second half of this year, it should become a little bit more challenging. Or will there be something that picks up the inflation baton from here going forward? Now, a lot of people talk about Japan and their experience historically. Uh, I'm going to do the same, I'm afraid. Um, and what, what this chart shows, or this table, is really the measures that have been employed by Japan to try and raise inflation over the last 30 years. And on the right-hand side, you can see they've changed the central bank mandate. They've done about eight rounds of fiscal stimulus, meaningful fiscal stimulus. Uh, they've used negative rates, equity purchases, corporate bond purchases, and yield curve control. And yet, none of this has worked. And so through COVID, what we've actually experienced is Western central banks really repeating what Japan has tried and, and what hasn't actually led to any material and persistent inflation over the last decade, which has surprised many. We have seen a rise in money supply in the United States. I've touched on that already. Money supply in the US is running at around 25% year over year at the M2 level. Um, and that doesn't necessitate reflation. It doesn't necessitate um, persistent rising inflation expectations over time. And China's quite a good example through the financial crisis. You can see here on, on this slide that M2 money supply growth in China was running at about 30% post-financial crisis. Um, and, that, and that really came at a time when inflation or CPI was negative there. And you had a good year to 18 months of base effect rolling through and a little bit of pent-up demand. But actually, very quickly, you went back to this disinflationary trend. And I question whether we might witness a similar kind of thing this time around. And there's a few reasons why I think that will be. Um, and there's a couple of things that I think maybe are under underappreciated by, by a few people. Um, velocity of money is clearly one of them. Now, this is relatively backward looking, uh, but there's a number of reasons why we think that this may continue to be challenged. What you can see here is in velocity of money, it, the Fisher equation, velocity of money times money supply equals nominal GDP growth. Um, velocity of money has really been very, very low levels. And there's some structural factors specifically relating to the labor force that suggest that this may continue. According to CBO estimates, the labor force, uh, labor force participation rate will continue to fall over the next 10 years. And so that may offset some of this rising money supply. Um, and that's kind of what we've seen so far. Um, and so I question for 2022 whether this will be something that reverses. The more contentious point that I have to, to, to talk about um, that I think is, is, is really interesting is, is really the impact of QE. A lot of people said that it should be reflationary. And even in, in the financial crisis, Ben Bernanke said, um, you know, we are going to print money. And he had to actually unwind that comment a year later and said, um, oh, actually, you know, we are not, we are, we're effectively not allowed to print money. And, and that's under the Federal Reserve Act. Um, and if you check the Fed's website, you'll actually see that that's the case. Um, they are, importantly, lender of last resort, not spender of last resort. And on this chart, what you can see is base money, which includes QE. Uh, M2 doesn't actually include directly uh, excess reserves, which, which are a product of QE. Um, and we've inverted that in, in green, uh, in, in, sorry, in dark blue, base money. And so you can see that as that line goes down, that really is a proxy for QE increasing. And alongside that, you can see a very strong relationship that basically the more QE is done, the lower velocity of money gets. And so with that relationship still intact, once again, this points to the fact that actually QE is relatively inert. It creates excess reserves through that asset swap uh, with the commercial banks, but it doesn't necess necessitate inflation. There are a couple of other structural factors, and uh, I think these are the things that I will touch on um, very, very briefly that are still in place today and we think are critical when it comes to longer dated yields and also uh, things like inflation and, and demand. One of them is debt. Um, on, this, on this slide, you can see the efficacy of debt has declined. And what this shows is that in the 1970s, you had, for every dollar of debt that was issued, around 75 cents of GDP generation. You had relatively good payback. And now, fast forward to today, I mean, this, this data only goes to, to Q1 2020, but on our estimates, we're around the, the 30 cent level in terms of the payback you get for every dollar of debt issued. And so since the financial crisis, we've tried to bail ourselves out of a debt crisis with more debt. And that's very deflationary. It's not productive. 
Um, a lot of this debt has been used for non-productive things like share buybacks, um, for example. And so that 100 trillion that we've effectively added to global debt in the last, uh, let's say, 13, 14 years is weighing on growth, it's weighing on activity, and it also is weighing on long-dated bond yields. Um, and you can see here, it's affecting our star, it's affecting the neutral real interest rate. And this has been missed time and time again by economists and strategists when it comes to predicting the level of growth and inflation. And so we believe that that's critical. Just as another, another factor is that structural, so we've had debt, we've had, uh, here we've got demographics. And demographics will continue to work against us. We have aging populations in a lot of the developed world, but actually increasingly in the emerging market world as well. And just yesterday, there was an FT press release uh, uh, or article that highlighted that China will experience a population decline year over year. That is the first time in 50 years. And that will impact aggregate demand as China has been the key driver of marginal global growth over the last decade. And so we think that this trend will persist as populations age, and this is continuing. U.S. population growth in 1900 was running around 2% year over year, and now it is just 0.3% year over year. So it's a real challenge. And more specifically, in the U.S., 10,000 people every day turn 65. And typically, between the age of 45 and 70, the average person halves their spending. And so as more people are tipping into retirement, that spending or that aggregate demand drag will be very, very visible because birth rates are quite low. And I will, I'll throw this out here as my last point um, and before handing it back to Francisco, and this is on where things might go and maybe what is underappreciated. I've talked about China being a big driver of marginal growth, um, and that is important for inflation. They, they consume about 50% of, of, of base metals uh, and, and commodities um, globally. And if you can get the direction of China right, broadly speaking, you would have been able to trade a lot of macro variables very, very well over the past 10 to 15 years. And what you can see here is the Chinese credit impulse has really rolled over. The credit impulse is basically the change, uh, the rate of change in lending activity um, or, or, or debt accumulation. Um, and when that shifts, it has quite a meaningful impact on, on global manufacturing, but it also leads things like the commodity cycle by between six and nine months. And it also leads G3 interest rates by around three to six months. And with this rolling over, what is suggesting to me is that in the second half of this year and the beginning of 2022, China may actually be putting quite a bit of disinflationary pressure back into the market. And that may affect growth and it may affect uh, how inflation is priced. So I'll, I'll leave it there and hand back to, to Francisco. Thank you so much, Harry. Let's not sure if it is the first time that we saw population decline in China. At least it is the first time that we saw it since the records began. That's it's almost 70 years ago. Um, Tim, I'll, I'll, I'll hand the floor to you. Tim is also a CFA chart holder, um, has an expertise in, in money markets and fixed income, and a portfolio manager at, at, uh, at, Fid, at Fidelity. Tim, we'll be delighted to hear from you. Sure. Hi, thanks, Francisco. So yeah, it's always, it's always slightly tricky to come, uh, you know, it's slightly tricky to come third in these sort of things. So I think in my, my argument here, I'm going to be, there's some, going to be some bits of Gautier's argument that I like and some bits of Harry's argument that I like. And so what you'll get is a bit of a, bit of a mashup of the two, but hopefully with a, with a slightly different sort of, sort of flavour kind of coming out of it, really. Um, I mean, I think we've already spoken a little bit about what's happened to break evens and what's happened really to, you know, market expectations of inflation, the amount, the amount that, that people are talking about it. The fact that we're here today having a, um, you know, I've been, I've been managing inflation funds for five years. I've never, I've never had so much demand on my time, actually, for people wanting to talk about inflation. So, um, yes, perhaps, perhaps that's a good thing. Perhaps that's a little bit worrying. Um, but, yeah, you've got, you've got here on, on, on the chart, we've got the, you know, the current on the left hand side kind of. 10 year break evens in, 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 in the US, actually a little bit, a little bit higher than that today. But I would point out, um, you know, uh, Harry pointed this out as well. But, you know, the 30 year average is kind of US realized US inflation has been about 2.3. And, you know, five year, five year uh, forward break evens is sort of 2.35 today. So moving, moving back to, you know, the markets moved back to something like a sort of 30 year um, uh, kind of average expectation. And I guess that's why, you know, the sort of fidelity central case here, and this is going to be a bit like Gautier's, you know, feel like, um, uh, in the sort of longer term, we're, we're, we're going to move to pre-COVID plus kind of environment. So, you know, 
moving away from those sort of last 10 years where we've had kind of fairly depressed sort of 1.7 ish kind of average inflation in the US, you know, to something a bit higher. So, so sort of 2.3, something like that, but yeah, but not run away. So, so, you know, um, picking up some, some of Harry's points here, um, you know, certainly think that we'll see this big spike, you know, largely base effects kind of in the next couple of months. And we will see a bit of a decline. Um, right hand side, you've got some survey of sort of market professionals done by Deutsche Bank. Hola, viva. Everyone's, everyone's Mark, can I kindly ask for you to put on mute? Thank you so much, Mark. So yes, on, the, on, on, on my next slide here, I mean, this is not actually a prediction. So this is just if you take kind of current, if you take where we are in terms of US uh, uh, year on year inflation, then kind of overlay, you know, add on uh, for the next year or so, simply uh, month on month rates that are equal to the last five years of month on month rates. Um, you know, you can see it kind of clean illustration here of the impact that base effects are going to have on the year on year rate. So you can see you can get to nearly 4% in headline, really just assuming a kind of five year average kind of month on month. So, you know, if you allow for additional kind of increases in energy prices and, and, and some of those kind of goods prices, you know, we're seeing very strong kind of goods inflation driven by some of these bottlenecks at the moment, you can see how high, you know, we, we will probably easily reach 4% probably in the next couple of months in terms of the year on year rate. But then there is naturally speaking a kind of decline after that. So I guess, I guess what I think the interesting kind of point of debate as I say, you know, it feels like, and I'll come on to this in the next few slides, but it feels like the longer term outlook, you know, kind of pre-COVID plus, you know, the very, very short term is going to be very, very strong with, yeah, base effects, but also this kind of strong goods, um, you know, kind of coming from commodity bottlenecks. And then we've got a couple of rotations kind of between that short term, you know, the kind of gap between the short term and the long term, I guess, is the interesting point from a, you know, from a market's point of view. I can see a couple of rotations within that. So first of all, you know, I expect, I mean, I think economies are pretty good at clearing bottlenecks. They seem to be more persistent um, um, than, than I would have expected. But, you know, I'd expect a lot of those kind of supply bottlenecks to clear. Gautier had some nice charts of sort of container shipping prices and so on. But I do think economies are probably pretty good, you know, at, at reacting to kind of, uh, you know, supply constraints in terms of goods. So I expect those to clear, you know, in the next few months. Uh, but they should be replaced by a kind of increase in, in services prices. And then after that, expect that increase in services, X housing really, to be replaced by kind of strength in shelter. And that's kind of, I think, where I'm going to be different from the previous two speakers. You know, I do feel quite optimistic about the outlook, particularly for the US, for the, for, for the rental sector in the US. And I think it's that strength which will bridge us, you know, bridge us from your sort of nearly 4% inflation kind of mid-year, you know, should keep us up, up to sort of 2.3, maybe even 2.5 by the year end. I've kind of listed on the right hand side some of the drivers there, but um, I think the other speakers have kind of kind of covered those quite well already. So yes, so talking a bit more about that 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 kind of case for longer term, um, uh, you know, longer term inflation. And Gautier already mentioned this. You know, I do think there are some so there are some real things going on there that could that will keep us, you know, in the, in the, take us to this kind of pre-COVID plus environment. And the first one is demographics, actually. I think I'd probably disagree with Harry on the impact of demographics. I think, you know, Japan is, is, is obviously a difficult example, but I think I'd, you know, I'd really regard Japan as a sort of different and sort of special case. Um, uh, you know, for example, if you look at Germany between sort of the mid 90s and the mid 2000s, you had a fairly kind of sharp fall in the kind of percentage of working age population there. But actually HICP inflation was kind of as good as it's been, you know, for the last 20 years and on the left hand side there I've got a different example this is a BIS paper uh, from a couple of years ago um, um, you know where they did a kind of cross-sectional analysis of different countries and you can see the countries with with aging populations actually experienced higher rates of inflation which kind of makes sense to me actually I sort of think that you know we're talking about I mean the economies these days are principally services based you know principally talking about kind of labor costs um, uh, you know, if you've got a sort of smaller number of working people looking after a large, large kind of aging populations, it seems to me you might need to pay those, those smaller number of working people more to do that and do that kind of services work. Deglobalization, Gautier talked a bit about that. Absolutely. I think, you know, a strategic need for countries to kind of onshore their production chains and so on could be quite inflationary in the, in the coming sort of decade. And then on the right hand side, you know, Absolutely, most of the fiscal stimulus has been, has been been very, very powerful and unprecedented, but also you know short lived. But there does seem to be a bit of a change of attitude in terms of uh, in terms of politicians, probably for the longer term. You know, be less less sort of talk about austerity in the kind of longer term and more more sort of um, uh, you know active active kind of fiscal policy there. Um, 
I should probably speed up a little bit, but you know, illustration here, we talked already um, a kind of short term factor, this kind of pent up saving, you know, probably about 10% about of US, US GDP now has been sort of excess saved by, by US consumers. And at the same time, they're kind of underspent by about 5% of GDP on services. So in the short term, you know, we could see that spending come back and that's the kind of short term, short term bounce that we've talked about. Then here's this kind of medium term switch. So I've talked about the kind of short term bounce. We've all talked about that. You know, I've talked about the kind of longer term sort of, you know, steady but higher inflation environment. The kind of bridging factor, I think, probably is housing prices. Um, uh, you know, this has been a different, a big story, I suppose, in, in terms of inflation in sort of 08. Um, you know, the sort of 08 crisis was really that, you know, inflation in the US didn't trough till 2010, largely driven by kind of sustained and continuing weakness in, in the sort of shelter component, which is basically rents. Uh, it's, it's a third of the US uh, CPI basket, so a very important kind of component of that inflation basket. Um, now, obviously, this time it hasn't been a kind of housing driven recession, it's been quite different, and you've seen quite a rapid actually recovery in, in, in house prices for sale. Um, you know, a lot of kind of middle-aged people have actually come through the kind of COVID crisis quite well, at least in terms of their finances, and they've been trading up, you know, dri driving up kind of house prices for sale. Now there's been weakness in rent prices, but you know, we think that there, there should be an arbitrage mechanism between those and the sale prices, which should bring that rents component up um, sort of by the end of the year. And then that should, that should furthermore kind of, kind of support the sort of services component of inflation. That, that probably I, that, that probably kind of concludes my kind of prepared remarks. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 if we talk about how do you kind of position for this, uh, you know, kind of mid, you know, longer term kind of reasonably positive kind of inflation environment, you know, short term spike and then a bit of a drawdown to get to that. Um, I still think there's a place for index linked bonds quite like, you know, valuations here. I think that break evens, you know, com the valuations compared to nominals are actually not too expensive. So, you know, roughly in line with the sort of 30 year average there. Uh, so, we, you know, would urge, urge you to kind of keep, keep kind of index linked bonds and inflation linked bonds within your portfolio, but we'll kind of stress a sort of shorter end. So sort of maybe a sort of five year kind of position within that. Exactly, Tim. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation and the quality of the slides of, of yours and, and, and your colleagues. And you are talking about something that I think distinguish a, a macroeconomist for, for a portfolio manager, because we, we may have a high conviction view in, 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 in whatever it is. But the second step that we cannot forget is to, is to how to implement it, because that's the second part of, the, of all our work. So what would be the, 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 the key portfolio? I will start to, with you, Tim. What would be the key portfolio characteristics that you would, that you would like to, to build? Um, and also, João Filipe Gomes uh, from the audience asks specifically about tips, whether or not you would like to, to, to put it on your, on your portfolio. We've seen that, that inflation break-evens are perhaps at the top, more than two and a half percent, more or less. So exactly how, how would, I will ask the, the three of you how to implement our views or your views, but, but Tim, I would start with you, if, well, you, think, if you like. Sure, yes, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I ran ahead a little bit onto the positioning, positioning kind of part of the uh, presentation there. But I think the nice way to kind of square these kind of differing, you, you know, kind of differing risks probably is to continue. You know, I, I would advise kind of continuing to hold tips, uh, you know, within, within your kind of multi-asset kind of portfolio um i think you you've got i think there, there could be a little bit more value in terms of break even so i'm not necessarily saying that we've totally topped out here but i think what we're probably happening now is a little bit of a transition really from kind of break even you know break even widening um uh, to more like more you know switch kind of out of that a little bit and kind of look more to kind of holding kind of real yields and i guess that's um you know maybe a way to square actually quite a lot of the views we've already held um uh you know, I think in the next couple of months, a bit like Harry said, we'll definitely start to see people focus on, you know, the high level of yields. They'll start to worry that, uh, you know, measured inflation has kind of peaked and is starting to kind of come down a bit. Um, uh, you know, that they'll start to think that too much is kind of priced in in terms of sort of central bank action. Um, but at the so, 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 so it's kind of the kind of the way to square that then, as I say, is to is to is to is to, is to is, 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 you know is is to kind of be happy with 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 owning some fixed income, but kind of within that 
you know, I still I still think that probably actually actually kind of real yields are a good place to be. So 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 tips are a good place to be. Uh, and if you are worried, you know, if you worried are worried about something like a sort of wage price spiral, so kind of inflation really kind of really kind of accelerating up, which I I don't think probably is is that likely. Certainly not in the short term, given how much spare capacity there there is in the economies. But you know, if you are worried about that, then then probably you know five years is probably the, the place to be where you know in terms of where you take that tips exposure because you've got the central banks on your side as well you know we've seen the fed you know again and again sort of reiterating their commitment to easy policy um, you know we've seen kind of five year actually real yields you know really stay quite well anchored even as the curve has steepened up and so i'd sort of say well you know be be where you've got the central bank on your side which is you know not at the longer end but 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 you know basically roughly sort of five years thank you so much tim Gauthier, how would you implement the portfolio with, with this view? What are your, your, your key exposures that you believe would, would make sense? Uh, so just just before starting on our views, uh, basically we have uh, two uh, two uh, kind of strategies to place the inflation. So one uh, pure inflation dedicated portfolio, but also uh, playing the inflation trade in our multi asset uh, vehicles here at uh, CPR and, uh, and Amundi. So regarding the pure inflation vehicle, we are working uh, with no interest rate duration risk. So basically, uh, the portfolio construction is rather systematic. We are long inflation linker. Uh, inflation link bonds, TIPS, and, uh, and European. And we are short uh, uh, 10 years bonds uh, via futures or uh, derivatives. So this means, uh, if, you, if you get me right, we have a, a null duration, absolutely zero uh, uh, interest rate risk. And uh, we kind of isolate the pure exposure to inflation. Uh, so uh, the, the vehicle is uh, is uh, exposed to to both the U.S. and German inflation, so uh, European. I mean, uh, we are also managing this fund as uh, with a, with an active and discretionary management. So we are able to tilt, you know, the, uh, our exposure towards the U.S. and Europe, and also OECD countries. If we see, uh, I don't know, a very constructive trade, uh, either in the U.K. or uh, in Australia, if that might happen one day. Uh, today we are slightly overweight on the U.S. Uh, uh, but as well on the, on the eurozone, so we have respectively 54 and 51 uh, percent on inflation ex exposure uh, in terms of leverage in the fund, uh, resulting in a in a break-even exposure of uh, 9.7 uh, against uh, 9.3 in the benchmark. Uh, we also prefer five to ten years linkers, so uh, rather short terms. Uh, also playing on the on the tips uh, limited supply in the US. Uh, which uh, will uh, relatively decrease uh, in the pool of uh, US COVID. Uh, also, uh, yeah, I, I was saying we also play this uh, this inflation trade uh, in our uh, multi-asset portfolio. Um, so uh, we basically in CPRM we manage a, a beta allocation portfolio. Uh, so uh, very global uh, universe 50/50 uh, 50, 50 equity fixed income. But at uh, as of today, we have eight uh, percent exposure on inflation strategies, uh, which believe me is quite significant when. You when you look at the history of the fund. Uh, today, we're still holding to this 8%, but uh, we're uh, also looking at uh, taking profits uh, probably later in the coming weeks or months. Uh, as, as base effect with, uh, will, uh, will also fade away. And uh, uh, yeah, basically, uh, basically that's it for the strategy. On the on the pure uh, inflation strategy, uh, I, I was saying that we we are able to, you know, we the portfolio construction is is quite systematic in the sense that we are long uh, linkers and short uh, futures, uh, but we manage with a very active and, and discretionary management. Uh, so there is a, a quite a big leeway on uh, on uh, U.S. inflation exposure and uh, and, and European inf uh, inflation exposure. Uh, uh, but what's important to remember is that on this specific vehicle, uh, our uh, real rate exposure will, all, will always be close to uh, to zero. So of course there is always a, a, a quite a, a, I don't know technical leeway I would say. But uh, uh, the philosophy really of what we're trying to do is is pure exposure on inflation and uh, and no uh, interest rate uh, risk. Okay, good. You thank you so much. And how about you, Harry? Short CPI, long term, long medium term or short term how do you see it how do, do you implement this 
Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate. It. I had, I, I, I think, some somewhat different views, and and I think it's 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 really about probably time frame because I think ultimately, uh, over you know twenty years, I think we end up losing control of inflation because I, I think that in the next downturn we might see uh, the rule book get ripped up and 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 helicopter money in earnest start to, to emerge or MMT in, in in a more meaningful manner. Um, but in the horizon of the next you know one to two years. Um, I think that there's some, some underappreciated value in some disinflation assets, and that largely speaks to some of the positioning arguments that I, that I made. Um, it's no, no suggestion that, that you can't necessarily make money in, in tips, uh, for example. It depends on what real rates do. Um, it's more the fact that I think that people are underweighting some of these defensive duration, duration plays, um, and people are a little bit on one side of the boat. Um, but in terms of portfolio construction, and I think that's really the heart of your question, the, the strategy, well, there's, there's, there's two types of strategy that I run. I run investment grade portfolios, but I also run flexible bond portfolios that can invest across the entirety of the rating spectrum, you know, from sovereigns, you know, AAA rated sovereigns, all the way through investment grade, high yield, emerging markets, uh, and, and FX. And so it's, it's pretty, pretty much always the case that we never have a single trade on. Um, is in the whole portfolio won't be orientated to play reflation or deflation. There will be naturally things in there that may act as tail risk hedges against both scenarios, and there's always things to do in each of those pockets. So, you know, we do have some medium to long dated rates exposure. Um, we've seen the long end start to flatten out a bit in, in some of the, the, the curves. US uh, 2030s started to flatten out. They appear to be hitting a little bit of a ceiling. It doesn't mean they nece necessarily top out here. But there's some option value in that. Um, and so we do see some portfolio rationale, uh, rationales to hold some of these assets as a tail risk hedge against future volatility when risk sentiment is, is so high. Um, and we're seeing risk-seeking behavior across pretty much all asset classes. And you know, US high yield yields are back to all-time lows, for example. Um, and so when, when we look at portfolio construction in that regard, we do have some, some plays that will benefit from the status quo. So from a slightly reflationary environment uh, with CPI rising, you know, things like high yield and certain emerging markets could do quite well. It could be a bit damaging for the dollar if they continue to print money uh, or, or at least do QE. Um, and and th that part of the portfolio will do quite well, th those, those risk asset elements. But alongside that, that barbell of running them alongside each other uh, when optionality we think is a bit cheap and some of these leading indicators like the Chinese credit impulse are rolling over a little bit, we think that they could, uh, they, they could actually prove quite valuable if this reflation narrative in the short term starts to be questioned a little bit more. So that, that's kind of the context of, of how we build that positioning um, and, and what it means to us from a portfolio perspective. Mm -hmm. Understood, Harry. Thank you so much. But yeah, I would like to, to ask you a um, question. We've heard from, from the three of you about uh, the base effects. We, we heard yesterday Powell saying that uh, the inflation that we'll see on, on the next couple of months will be transitory, the same to, to Madame Lagarde. So the idea here, here that I would like to ask you is, if later this year, beginning 2022, we see inflation above, let's say, a little bit above 2%. Do you think that central bankers will be able to look at us in the eyes and say, we will keep interest rate at these levels? Or will the bond vigilantes do not allow this to happen? How do you see this? Do you think they will have the power to, to maintain, as they say, low, low, low interest rates? You are on mute, Gutierrez, please. And yes, I have to start me. from the yeah, beginning. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, no, no, but you're right. I mean, would they be able to look at us in the eye and say we will not move? Uh, short answer, probably no. Uh, currently, they've been very explicit that they think this inflation is currently uh, only a temporary base effect. Uh, plus, under their uh, average inflation targeting, uh, the AAT, 
uh, they are able to tolerate an inflation slightly above the 2% for a certain time. But as uh, usual, this is a very blurred definition. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a given. We'll see base effect uh, later this year. CPI jump in second quarter of this year. Uh, I, I remember a report from a Nordia analysts uh, uh, talking about a 7% headline CPI rate uh, peaking in June or, or July, I don't remember. Uh, and at the same time, we have uh, Powell, uh, I think, uh, yesterday evening saying that uh, uh, the current break-even rates are still compatible with their uh, AIT uh, targets. Uh, so he says there is no need for actions right now. Uh, but in our view of, uh, you know, ramping up inflation uh, coming from the money supply, the shortage of supplies and uh, the door disorganized uh, uh, supply chains, uh, but also, of course, uh, base effects. If we have higher inflation, realized inflation in the coming months, uh, I mean, uh, probably for the Fed, it's still, uh, it's probably not as comfortable with rising inflation to keep, you know, their, their position. Um, I think Powell yesterday said that uh, if uh, inflationary pressures were to build up or inflation expectations to, to, to ratchet above the 2% uh, goal, uh, they will not hesitate to act. So I think uh, the answer was, uh, was, uh, was, was given yesterday evening. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, the, 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 the whole uh, adamant uh, say that they will not cut uh, their support and recovery plans. So it's all very confusing to me. Uh, and to be honest, uh, given what they're saying, uh, they're playing on both sides. Um, uh, and, it's, the, it's, and the consequence is that if, if they increase, what will happen to the debt burden that we have? Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, they're, uh, they can't really uh, rate hikes that much uh, and, and that close to the, to the, to the recovery. And uh, also, it reminds me that it's very different from uh, post-GFC that uh, we've had in uh, 2009, 2010, and, and when, uh, you know, uh, austerity was the name of the game. Uh, now they're only talking about supports and supports and recovery plans. So I think we're uh, uh, totaling, uh, I don't know, maybe five or six trillion US dollars of uh, uh, plans to be uh, uh, to be funded, so it's it's very contradictory. Uh, once again, you know the, the Fed there uh, there is a, the uh, they make the rule and uh, and uh, probably they uh, they have very uh, uh, how to say a short view on this because I mean uh, given March and uh, yesterday's uh, uh, FOMC notes, uh, we've seen a pretty significant uh, uh, move on this. So probably no, they they won't they won't stay uh, they won't stay and look at uh, inflation derailing at uh, at uh, three or four or five percent. Uh, probably not. A, a, a future topic for us to discuss. Yes, a yes, of yes. Years from now. So let's do a roundtable end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, tell me tell me something. We um, we have seen some some demand pull and and cost push cost push inflation. We've seen some, some commodities like, like in, the, in the graphs presented uh, about copper. We, we've seen timber, perhaps related to, to housing in, in, in the US. We see what is happening in chips manufacturing, so delays in, in delivering of, of, of cars. And a lot of pent-up savings that I don't know uh, what will happen in, in spending all this money that is, that is hard from the last couple of months. My question to you is, do you think that the economy has or will have spare capacity? Mm. As that's, as that's probably the ultimate question. And, uh, and uh, on the short term, you know, with the disruptions that we've seen, uh, probably not. And that's what driving uh, uh, short-term inflation. One of the uh, one, one, a great example I heard at the beginning of the week was the used car prices in the U.S., uh, they skyrocketed, the price skyrocketed like 50% uh, last month. And this is, I mean, the best example. You have uh, uh, people that have more money today than before the crisis. You have a shortage of, uh, of new cars because of uh, disruption in, uh, you know, uh, supply chains, in, uh, in uh, freights uh, between Asia and uh, the U.S. So you end up with uh, fewer goods, uh, fewer new sale car and, uh, and, and people uh, with loads, loads of money. So, yeah, prices up uh, for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of goods. Uh, used cars, copper, timber, you said it. So, um, 
yeah, technical factors, base effects, yes, uh, definitely. And on the medium terms, uh, no, no inflation derailing, but uh, definitely some uh, uh, higher inflation uh, than than previous years. And, and how about you, Harry? What what's what's your view about this this spare capacity in the economy? Yeah, it's, it's it's a very very interesting one. I think there's a couple of different legs that are critical to to the story. Um, so. I mean, it, from, from our perspective, what we think we've seen and the FRED, the, the, FRED, the, the US data site that's run by Federal Reserve, that's a great source of information for this. Um, you, you can see on, on, on there, if you're looking at things like um, monthly, but year over year, um, durable goods purchases in recent, in recent months, and this, the latest data are out is it, primarily around, around the turn of the year, so December, January, uh, February. Um, it's kind of running around 20% year over year above the pre-COVID levels. Um, and, and so we've seen this big shift of durables because people haven't been able to spend on the services. And, and conversely, the services dynamic has actually seen a, a, a deficit or actually negative spending. And both of these two, the PCE, um, personal consumption expenditure, typically runs over you know, the last decade. It's run around 5% year over year level uh, on, on that metric. So you have seen a shift and that's created bottlenecks um, especially with lockdowns, especially with supply disruptions. So, you know, that short term is very, it's very inflationary for parts of the, parts of the, of the world, but equally the services dynamics are very disinflationary. Um, on, on the uh, commodity space, I mean, I think this is one of the things that's fascinating about our jobs um, is, is that you end up looking at really, really unusual and listening to really unusual things. I mean, there was a great Bloomberg podcast, uh, Bloomberg Odd Lots, um, where they interviewed a, a lumbar trader, a lumber trader, so you know, wood trader, and went into the mindset of you know the whole dynamic around that industry and what's been going on, and and there are much much bigger, more nuanced elements behind some of these price moves that I think are definitely worth uh, worth consideration. Um, in commodities more broadly, there's quite a lot of speculation. So one of the things we look at to, to, to highlight that is is commitment of traders reports, um, and they, they they come out every week uh, every week. And we're seeing big net longs from hedge funds, from, from speculative accounts uh, in, in a lot of commodities. Copper would be a prime example of that. And also some of the ags um, would be a prime example. And I think ultimately um, that may face a bit of backlash because if you're pushing food prices up short term because of hedge fund speculation, um, it could be very damaging for some segments of, of the economy. Um, so maybe that will eventually come out. But a lot of these things have Z scores that are well above one. Uh, suggesting that this positioning is quite extreme um, and that's something we focus on and we believe that there's a bit of froth in some of those spaces. Um, when it comes to excess savings, and sorry that this is a bit long-winded, but um, yes we have built up, as Tim said, a big backlog of savings. Um, we believe, and, and you know, Goldman Sachs um, would agree with our, um, with our view um, based, on, based on research we've read, is that about two-thirds of that built-up cash, of that excess saving, sits within top top four deciles, or the top 40% of the economy. Those are people that view it as a bit of a wealth transfer. They view it as something that, that they will probably save. And there was a great um, uh, survey that was done by, I think the CBO, um, that, that basically suggested that at least 60% uh, will be you know, saved or used to pay down debt uh, in terms of these, these uh, in, lower, in lower deciles. So the question is, will it be, will it be uh, spent or not, and, and to what degree? And that will determine the sugar rush, because I, for one, am definitely going to go on holiday as soon as I'm allowed to. Um, but it, it depends where actual saving rates settle. And so the final point I'll leave you with on this is, is savings rate historically. Um, in the financial crisis period, savings rates ran about... Um, in 2006, seven savings rates ran at around uh, you know three to three to four percent, um, and then in the in the kind of 2012 to 2018 period, they ran at around seven and a half percent. And so you saw this savings level actually increase post financial crisis, um, post that disruption, post that that kind of concern. We think that actually once again we will settle at a higher level of savings. Uh, precautionary savings because of this and it will leave some scarring so we don't think it will all be spent some of it will be um, but we think that, that 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 dynamic that Tim mentions the shift between durables and and services will be something that we witness over the next 12 months mm -hmm. understood makes sense Tim I would like you I would try to share here a very interesting 
Let me. I will kindly ask if if everybody is seeing my 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 screen. Yes. Let me just. Yes. And I will have to explain what what I'm what I'm showing right here and 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 for you to to comment, team. Uh, the monetary approach. On on our right hand side in white, what we do have is the M3 money growth from OECD countries. This is broad money. This is not base money. This is something that I believe it's very, very different from the previous crisis when we have on the global financial crisis that we saw base money increasing. But but since we had the credit crunch, um, not that much broad money. But now we see this 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 white line, an increase of 18% year on year. On an, on the blue line here below, we see the OECD average inflation. Okay. A regression on the left hand side. R squared, respectable 60. Okay, we see here a more or less a trend line. We are here, and uh, let me say like this the model would say 10%. Tim, care to comment this? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm not much, maybe, you know, you might be surprised to hear me say this. I guess I'm not much, I've never been much of a, a monetarist. I, I guess, you know, you, 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 you were sort of picking up sort of, the, you know, sort of Milton Friedman sort of, you know, paper in the 60s, wasn't it? Sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, inflation isn't always, it is an, always and everywhere a, a, a monetary uh, phenomenon. I mean, I think, you know, Francisco, for example, if you, if you were to change that, change the sort of starting date on your chart there, this is quite good. This is sort of show and tell this, isn't it? You know, if you this is the, as, school, as long as I can. This is the, the <laughs> data no, 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 starts I, in 81. I want, so. I want you to shorten it. I want you to turn it to, you know, take it to 2000 or 2010, for example, because I bet you'll see that, you'll see the red line. Oh, sorry, on the scatter plot. I, 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 I will do it. You'll, you'll see the red line flatten. Uh, you know, you'll see, it, you'll see it flatten quite a bit. And I suppose... Um, you know, this is my central point, really, which I don't think actually money supply, certainly on any kind of investment, you know, investment relevant horizon, I don't think money supply has very much at all to do. Your, your with, point exactly. To do with realized inflation. Um, 11% which, R squared. Which I suppose is, uh, yeah, no, yeah, what if you turn it from 20, take 2010 to 2020, for example? Um, it, basically, what's happened is absolutely we've had, we've had, you know, we've had kind of QE and, you know, if the central bank buys buys government bonds from you know from end investors, then absolutely there's a one on one you know one on one match between the the, the increase in, in in reserves and the increase in M one uh, and, and and consequent kind of increase in broader money as well. But you know central bank buying those government bonds from a sort of end investor, that end investor is not going to go and buy services with them. That invest in, or, or, or consumer goods or something like that. You know that end investor is basically going to go and buy more financial assets. And so you know this is well worn sort of theme really um uh, of qe i mean qe was very very successful in the first you know what was it originally intended for it was originally intended to make sure that the banks within the within the reserve system didn't run out of money uh, uh, you know didn't run out of reserves to sort of settle settle their overnight transactions so qe you know super effective at that actually but um uh, you know really since then much more effective at driving up asset prices than it has been you know than it has been at driving up consumer prices um, so you know if, the, if this was to drive if this was to drive inflation then that would be a good way of getting out of the debt burden and so on inflating our way out of the debt burden but really i can't see you know i can't see this kind of increase in, in money supply having much to do much to do you know much kind of positive in, impact in inflation and that's the kind of tragedy of, of of the sort of central bank balance sheet expansion you know the extent to which it has has simply kind of inflated uh, um, asset prices i mean we did talk i, I I don't know. I, I sort of feel like there might be a question kind of later about crypto. So I don't want to kind of preempt that, but, you know, <laughs> thinking of ways in which you could do more effective. I mean, obviously the kind of, you know, checks and the kind of direct fiscal stimulus that way, I think is a much more powerful way of, of fueling growth and, and actually fueling inflation than, than this kind of central bank activity. And then maybe a sort of central bank digital currency might be a sort of hybrid kind of monetary and fiscal stimulus that would that would get you the same thing the, well. the, i think that will avoid the principle because they will be able to manage the money supply 
the quantity of money, either it is in, in, in coins or in our wallet or, or, or in, in the computer. So that, 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 that voids the principle. I mean, it's not or you have a risk. Set... Uh, you know, I think Harry said about, you know, yeah, you, you do risk unintended consequences there. And it's not you know, a massive increase in powerful kind of money, but certainly this kind of, you know, I'd, I'd largely disregard the sort of measure that, you know, 25% increase in US money supply or 15% increase in Eurozone money supply, which we've seen, I, I'd probably largely disregard that. Because if you look at bank lending as well, I mean, actually, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, both within the Eurozone and within the US data, you know, kind of bank lending, apart from, you know, that loans which are guaranteed by governments has, has, has been kind of strongly negative, you know, since the start but, of the COVID but, but crisis. This really. other part is important. Yeah? The, the, the other part that is guaranteed is Let's see and, and let's hope that this money will be spent in, on productive sure. ways. Sure, that's a, that's a good point. That's the key point for, for the economy, not just inflation. But yeah, Tim talked about the, the effects on, 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 on financial assets. We, we can say that inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. But today, we have a lot of things like, like we discussed in the introduction that in fact has a, a marginal cost of zero. So another Netflix subscription costs zero to the company. It was not like this 20 years ago where things were stuff, more or less, and we have to, it had costs to, to develop. Do you think that in particularly financial assets and housing that we may say are not, uh, do not have a marginal, they, they are finite, so they, they are not another, another subscription. Do you think that we are experiencing price inflation on assets? Uh, yeah, great question. And uh, and I think Tim uh, touched base on the cryptos as well. And uh, that's a really good example on a finite, as you say, uh, uh, goods uh, that uh, are definitely not uh, marginal of zero. Of zero. So, I mean, answering your your question from a from a pure monetary standpoint, and uh, is, is is quite simple. I mean, yes, we should see inflation raising, but uh, as Tim just uh, demonstrated, and uh, and as we all know, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, QEs have uh, not been that successful in 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 sustaining inflation. Um, one thing, though, to uh, quite interesting to note is is uh, before monetization mostly was. Uh, you know, from quantitative easing and 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 uh, other uh, uh, support and monetary monetary plans used to go directly into assets. Um, I'm talking about money really uh, recirculating into stocks and bonds, and that basically drove uh, equities and bonds valuation at all time uh, highs. Uh, I mean. Uh, Basically, the Fed was uh, was 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 giving money to the to the to the fixed income space. Uh, that, uh, for once, was pure uh, financial inflation to me. Uh, now uh, that we're seeing direct helicopter money, it's a bit more uh, complicated. Um, if we look goods and services, yes, we are seeing some of these pricing uh, rising. Uh, housing market uh, in US uh, with uh, I don't I don't remember if it uh, if our Harry or Tim uh, talked about this but uh, have been a, a, a quite good example as well. Uh, when it comes to Netflix subscription, subscri subscri as you say, excuse me. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, much more difficult to 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 you know reason in terms of uh, uh, monetary uh, aspects uh, on this uh, uh, zero marginal costs uh, goods. Uh, maybe what we can say is uh, we'll see uh, two, two, two kinds of products. I mean, those, those with uh, indefinite uh, supply, like uh, like Bitcoin, like uh, uh, houses uh, experiencing uh, inflation, and uh, and that's kind of uh, what we're seeing. I mean, uh, I'm looking at the crypto space uh, on on a personal note, and uh, what what we've seen is is kind of crazy uh, uh, from a pure financial uh, point of view. Uh, it's it's uh, it's complicated because uh, we've seen this for years, uh, money fueling into into equities and uh, and fixed income, and uh, so we, we might we might see as you say uh, this kind of uh, dual inflation uh, uh, trajectory uh, for indefinite or finite goods. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Thank you, Guti. Interesting point, um, Harry. We. We may say that the Phillips curve is is dead. Well, we don't see it. At least we haven't seen it working in the in the in the long time. We the equation or, or the concept that we talk, where we have the, the GDP 
uh, times inflation is equal to the, to the amount of money times its velocity, well, it works, but it's because the velocity is, is, a, is a third term. That sentence that, that marks my, my study time, assume a risk-free rate of 5%, that, that's something that blows my mind to think about it. Do you think it's time for us to rethink our, our books? rethink our economic concepts I mean, once once again it's 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 very very interesting uh, aspect of our jobs i think it applies to economists strategists and fund managers and, and analysts uh, on a daily basis it's very very easy to read a textbook and you know read the read the term cetris paribus um and assuming un, un, you know assuming certain conditions or this that and the other and the reality of the real world is that it often doesn't doesn't play out like that, and some of these some of these equations or relationships don't hold. And trying to unpick why that is, it, and actually, as I was saying at the start, really question um, potentially the counterfactuals, um, you know, and and the, the contrarian perspective can be really valuable. Um, and actually, you know, especially when it comes to turning points. And so that was really the angle that I was getting at with, 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 with my presentation. But I, I think that, you know, the textbook is still extremely valid in the sense that it gives you a solid grounding of what, uh, you know, what, what should happen. Um, and, and, and then understanding the deviations around that is, is really where, you know, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of uh, potential opportunity. Um, you know, one of the things that we've 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 witnessed um, is you know, negative interest rates, for example. Logically, um, you know, logically cutting interest rates uh, when they're in positive territory should lead to more spending. Um, and in, in Europe, we've got negative interest rates, and that's that's related or actually seen a, a pickup in in, uh, in real life saving rates as, as a result of that. Maybe that's because you have to save more for retirement. Um, but actually, even in the US. Um, you know, there's very, very strong evidence that when interest rates actually fell below 5% at the 10-year level, the relationship between spending and interest rates actually broke down. Um, Bank of America actually produced a great report on this where, you know, if, if you had higher interest rates, actually the relationship was as you expected. But as interest rates sink from 5 to 0, actually you see that, that relationship flip and it's well before you get into negative territory. So it's, it's all of these kind of actual behavioral aspects that, that, that make the job so interesting. So I wouldn't rip up the, the CFA's textbooks or syllabus, especially um, those. <laughs> but but, um, but 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 I think I think uh, you know it's all about questioning it. And 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 as we as, as we've heard, there's a lot of good arguments for pretty much every case out there. And it just it, it's about trying to shift the probabilities in your favour. Mm -hmm. Tim, one, one, one question to you. You on on when you were um, explaining the the implementation of of the portfolio. You said that the, um, the PC, the personal consumption index, so the basket for the for the CPI in the in the United States, has about a third of uh, of rents, basically. Uh, here in Portugal, our CPI basket is is around four percent, and for the eurozone uh, CPI basket is seven and a half. Do you think that having this in mind, changing the basket will do the trick? Yeah, it's 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 a good question actually because I think um, I think the you know the sort of national sort of statistics agencies do get a bit of probably unfair uh, criticism. You know, you, you often hear um, uh, you, you often hear oh, measured inflation is kind of too low, and there's usually kind of people picking up on two things. You know, either people you get particularly sort of people who work in financial markets will sort of say, oh, you know, my personal rate of inflation is, is, is enormously higher than that. And it's kind of, all, you know, my golf club fees go up an awful lot. And, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know. Uh, and, 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 and so I sort of remind you on that point, you know, it, it's kind of the basket should be for the sort of typical consumer. So, um, you know, so, so you're know, not, not your kind of more sort of discretionary or luxury goods, I guess. And, you know, and I, I think probably the agencies do a good job of that actually and then you get the sort of second criticism well shouldn't they in, in also include asset prices and i think that is a bit more uh, that's actually a, a more interesting question i'm kind of coming to 
answering your question there. But I, I sort of think that they should probably only manage, you know, the assets that you have to have. So you don't, you don't actually have to buy, you know, growth equities or anything like that. So, so you know, to, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of include in, in that kind of asset price. But obviously you do have to, um, you know, everyone has to kind of have housing and, and either rent or, or sort of own, own housing. So um, uh, sort of roundabout way of saying, yes, I think that would be, you know, and obviously the U.S. has had, uh, you know, owner-occupied housing costs in, in the CPI basket for, for a long time. I mean, the U.K. has recently introduced the new measure cpih which includes our owner occupied housing i do think that probably would be you know i wouldn't include other things other kind of assets that you don't have to ha have to work in but i think that would be would be would be a good measure actually and that you know for the ecb i mean that would i mean i think they'd have to get the european commission and, and eurostat probably to agree but um you know it would it, it, it would probably be a fairer reflection of what what people are spending it would also you know have the have the added bonus of sort of adding i think about i saw an estimate of about 30 basis points to to you know eurozone hic or it would have done over the last few years so it's kind of a neat probably improves the fairness of the measure actually to reflect people's spending and also actually you know does get the ECB a little bit closer to their target so I think that would be would actually be something you know something that would might come out of this review that they're if the, if the review they're doing at the moment kind of came out with a recommendation that they should include owner occupied housing costs I think that would probably be a good thing four percent is too low for sure <laughs> Yes, yes. Harry, yes, a I don't question who spends that little on, on housing. Harry, a question from, from the from the audience. I will ask you this to you because I, I, I believe you have a little bit more experience in, in, in credit, not not in the part of, 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 of rates, because the question is about what should be our sector allocation, uh, assuming a reflationary um, reflationary view for the next couple of years sector of what do you prefer to invest uh, either in equities or, or credit it doesn't matter if, if, if that's your view um a, a a moderately kind of increasing or rising inflationary environment is, is generally fairly positive for some of the more levered parts of the market and some of the more cyclical parts of the market so if, if that's your view then then that's the trade that you'd be having on you'd probably be earning a little bit more in high yield a little bit more in some of the emerging markets if if your belief is that you know, liquidity is going to flood, uh, uh, flood the markets. Um, it could continue to lead to those parts of uh, the, the, the world to, um, to outperform. Um, typically, those are parts of the credit market, however, that are the most volatile and most uh, exposed to a reversal if, the, the change, uh, if a change in sentiment does, does materialize. So um, whether it's financials or methods of mining or energy, they end up being potentially quite volatile and, and recoveries in those sectors can be very, very poor um, if, if you do enter default and the energy sector has been, well, uh, a, a pretty much peak, uh, private equity disaster over the last kind of 15 years, uh, largely on that basis. Um, so so that those are what the focus would, would be if, that, if that's the view. I mean, I, I think from my perspective, I just, if I add my flavor to, to it, within the high yield markets, um, really the focus in the portfolios that, that, that I look after, um, the focus is on the slightly more defensive elements of the high yield market. And I don't mean by rating, um, I mean by sector allocation. So it doesn't matter if it's a, 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 you know, if you do your credit work and bottom up analysis on a single B or a triple C, it can still be a great investment, even though, you know, it's, it's, it's notionally more risky according to a third party rating agency, but you have to do your own work. Um, but in terms of my, you know, the, the, the high yield portfolio that, that, that I'm thinking of in, in Dynamic Bond, which is sold into to, to, to your regions, um, you know, of our high yield credit book, I would say that probably between 60 and 70 percent of that is in what I would consider to be less or acyclical sectors, so less cyclical or acyclical, because I think we've seen a lot of the cyclical catch up on this base effect dynamic and on the back of the stimulus. Um, and so from my perspective, chasing that further, um, when we've got that risk-seeking behaviour uh, from here, I'd question that. And so, you know, we've been focusing on those sectors, but also slightly shorter dated rolling call opportunities where you can clip nice carry um, in, in, in relatively stable uh, end markets um, just in case uh, markets struggle to rally because, as I mentioned, you know, valuations are not what they were. Um, you know, really the time to be loading, loading the boat on, on, on risk assets was, was this time last year. Thank, thank you so much, Harry. Tim, we have a question from, from our audience for, for, for a thing that we actually didn't talk a, a lot. It's regarding fiscal policy. João, João Capsana did this, this question. 
and he asks if 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 we will have a um, different mindset from now on. I I I, I remember that that some last summer when we saw that, that joint issue of the European Next Generation Funds, the game changer that what it was, so common debt. So on the fiscal side, do you think that things will change? People will no longer worry so much about the deficit. I don't know if João was um, trying to, to, to mention modern mon monetary theory. How do you see the, the, the fiscal part here in play with, with inflation? I think I think I, I think that I think there has been I think that probably will be an enduring change of mindset, and it's it's good to measure mention that you know the uh, uh, eurozone kind of uh, uh, you know measures there. Um, you know you don't hear much from uh, I mean I think about the UK you don't you know you, you, you don't hear too much really about kind of you know you know we had the big obviously after the financial crisis we had the big kind of austerity measures you don't hear much too much about that and similar in the US as well um, so I think long term yes you, you know you're going to see more active fiscal policy um, the problem is to get there I think you've got a bit of a um, um, uh, you know, the kind of fiscal impulse actually is going to be quite sharply negative next year. So, um, I mean, particularly in the US, obviously had huge, um, you know, uh, a deficit, sort of 15% of GDP, something like that last year. You know, probably all the measures, you know, the, 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 the recovery plan they announced at the start of this year, um, you know, is probably just enough to keep the fiscal impulse. So that's the change in the deficit kind of neutral this year. But inevitably, they, you know, the, the, the tragedy of kind of fiscal stimulus is you only sort of, um, you only get it once and then you have to kind of um, uh, you have to keep spending the same amount to have no impact on GDP. So the, 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 the problem really that all, all fiscal stimulus has is that, um, you know, once you stop doing it, you actually get quite a negative sort of drag on growth. So, um, um, yes, I think some, you know, in the sort of longer term, governments will be more willing to run bigger deficits and, and be more active around, you know, slowdowns. But the problem is to get there, you know, next year is going to be quite tricky in terms of the sort of negative fiscal impulse that we'll see. Tim, your, your argument of you start fiscal policy, but then when you stop doing it, they, the, 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 the opposite, the effect that you have to keep doing it. And I, this... I, mean, I guess you hope that it's going to, you know, you hope that it's going to prime the pump and it'll be terribly, you know, some sort of new, terribly productive activity will happen and that will sort of take over. But I fear that the last 20 years suggests that that probably won't happen that effectively. But I, I was thinking on, on just a comment because that would be one hour and a half just to talk about this, is the effect that central banks assume that uh, quantitative easing policies had on the, on the economy. I, I wonder what will happen when, when this reverses. Will it be possible? That's a topic for another conference, not, not today. I will have, um, or, or David Tume has one, one, one final question for, for us today. That is regarding the expectations of um, one of the big generational wealth transfer that will happen in history. So we have uh, all the baby boomers that, that are approaching retirement, already retired, and will, will start to, to transfer wealth to, to the next generation. I think this has a lot of importance regarding inequality, but that's also another topic. The V2 my question is, can we relate this or what would be the implications of this wealth transfer for inflation? I will leave it open to, to each and of, of you three to, to answer this. I know that Tim and Harry, uh, uh, I think it was Harry that, that, that said that in the United States, 10,000 people retire every day. So let's assume that more or less 10,000 people also die every day. I don't know, maybe a little bit less, but how, how, how do you play this? Is, is there any angle here that, that we'd like to, to, to comment? Any, any of you three? If nobody wants, I will, I will challenge Gutier to comment on this because to make this even on the, pre on the presentation of, of all of us three. Yeah, uh, kind of a difficult one, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, about the, the, the great wealth transfers that we're seeing, uh, I, I don't know, I, it's quite difficult. I need, uh, well, I one thing is, one thing for sure, it will, it will present a lot of um, opportunities for us that work in the financial sector. That's for sure. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's yes. a good thing, but 
uh, the inflation, I don't know. I would like to, to, if you have any, any, any comments or team or, or Harry. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm happy to. I mean, so, so effectively, I think one of the reasons why inequality is, is so problematic now, there's, there's so many reasons why we have these big distortions. And so uh, you can look at indices like the Gini, Gini indices, which look at inequality, and they're basically at record highs. And my, my personal belief, this is not an official Jupiter view, but my personal belief is that I think central bankers are to blame for, for a lot of these policies. We've ended up having big shifts in, in things like pension schemes. We've gone from you know, having defined benefit, which was absolutely you know, golden egg. Um, I would love to have a defined benefit pension um, to define contribution at, at a period where we've got asset prices that are relatively expensive, going back to what we've, we've discussed. And I think that QE is, is largely responsible. Um, you know, there's an economic theory called Mar Marshallian K theory. And I think that that's exactly what we've seen. We've seen rather than, you know, these policies hit, hit the real economy, they, they've hit financial assets and that's benefited a certain demographic disproportionately. And they've ridden that wave, whether it's house prices or, or financial markets, um, or in fact, higher wage inflation than we've experienced in recent years. Uh, to being in a position of relative wealth versus the younger generations. And so the asset United owners, States, mm. who has assets? Exactly. exactly. Um, and, and, so, and so really it, it comes down to moral hazard from the central banks. They have felt it necessary to bail out every, every small wobble we've seen in the equity markets uh, and bond markets pretty much over the last um, you know, 15 years with more of the same. And so, and I think COVID actually, we've seen the same thing again. It's, it's been the people that can work from home remotely that benefit. And so I would argue that actually it's about, it's almost about time that, 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 that some people that, that are struggling to find work or work that pays well, you know, see a bit of benefit from an intergenerational wealth transfer. Um, whether or not, you know, it happens as quickly or uh, as people expect, I don't know. But in the United States, for example, you, you have... Uh, the highest proportion on record of people living with their parents because either rents or, or, or house prices are too expensive or they're trying to save for, for that. Um, and so with that kind of dynamic, I think it's not surprising we start to see nationalistic tendencies. We start to see more extreme politicians. Um, and one thing we didn't touch on is the fact that inflation, yes, uh, you know, the Freeman quote, a monetary phenomenon, I think actually it's, it's, it's shifting into a political one now because actually, you know, long term, the only way we're going to get out of the debt trap that we're in because of low productivity and um, the, the, low, uh, the low kind of payback that you get from raising debt is, is to inflate the debt away because you can't, you can't defloat, default on, a, on, a global, uh, on, on the global debt stack um, and it doesn't feel like you can grow out of it now either. So I think you know, when, we, when we talk about transitioning to policies where it's you know, sending checks to people, uh, or, or, or in, in fact, as China are trialing at the moment, sending digital currency uh, to subsets of the population with a, an expiry time on it, that, that, that could be a way for the central bank to, uh, I, I guess, be um, propping up specific parts of the con economy very directly. So I think we're going to have more intervention. Uh, and I think that actually, uh, you know, wealth transfer will be, will be a, a good thing um, to rebalance. Uh, and it might actually, over time, normalize the political disruptions we see. But it, it, it's a very, very contentious subject. Also a topic for another debate. For, for uh, the Financial Times has this week, this week has a special from, from the impacts of, not really the impacts, but, but they, they did a survey to, to, to I think it was 2,000 uh, young people, so below 35, and the challenge that, that happened, a lot of these topics are uh, very well explained there. It's interesting for, for all of us to, and all of our audience to, to take a look. If, uh, if, if, if they, yeah, I think it's very, very interesting. Gentlemen, it was a pleasure to be here with, with, with all of you. It was very, very interesting, and I am uh, really thankful for, for, for your hour and a half being here with CFA Society Portugal. Uh, I'm delighted to, to, to have done this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.